Uh, I read Natural Science at Cambridge at Clare, uh, and rather like Amin, I was, um, I, I, I was aspiring to be a great theoretical physicist. I sort of had a notion that I was going to be the next Einstein. And unfortunately, <laughs> it didn't quite work out. Um, I found uh, theoretical physics increasingly mathematical, uh, very little room for conceptual thinking, uh, and I just dived out. At the end of the second year, I said, that's enough. I'm just not going to crack this one. Uh, and I, I took the soft option, which was electrical science, moving to the engineering faculty. Uh, that wasn't entirely by chance. I was always, as a child, really interested in practical electronics and actually in the very earliest stages of computing. And I actually conspired with Eni Najoku, who sadly couldn't be with us tonight, but sends his regards. Uh, Eni and I actually <laughs> spent many hours together talking about you know, what we'd like to do with our careers. Uh, and at the time, the whole new era of digital was just beginning to emerge. Uh, a lot of people were going to computing, uh, a few people were going to telecommunications, and just like Richard, I thought, well, I, actually, I like telecommunications. I think that's probably going to be the big game changer. I mean, computing will be important, but I think telecommunications uh, is something that's so universal uh, to all of us that it's worth pursuing. So I left Claire. I was probably one of the few people to go into industry. <laughs> uh, my, my, the CD tutor, tutor at the time, Dr. Feinstein, said, Roger, you'd have a fine career in the civil service. Uh, my father said, go and work for the British Post Office, you'd have a career for life. I think neither of them really understood <laughs> my DNA. <laughs> I was a risk taker and a bit of a maverick, actually. <laughs> so I went into, uh, I went into uh, engineering uh, at Plessy in their telecommunications group, uh, actually looking after a whole sort of new digital signaling pro pro project but realized uh, that engineering in the UK, particularly electrical engineering, was not the uh, high profession that I had aspired to. It was actually pretty menial uh, and not well paid at all. So uh, following Ennis' example, I actually went off to MIT. Uh, and at the time I'd had a, a, a fully funded uh, research grant to do a PhD at Cambridge. So that was a, a, a well-trodden path. Uh, and again, coming back to the risk taker, I said, no, that's not good enough. I'm going to go to MIT where I have no funding, <laughs> uh, no prospects. Uh, I might get through a master's degree, but not necessarily a PhD. But what the hell, I'm going to do it. So off I went. Uh, and after a term or two of nail biting uh, uncertainties, I actually got a research grant. Uh, and more importantly, that research grant was awarded by ARPA. Uh, to be one of a small team of people to design something called the ARPA network. Uh, and at the time, ARPANET was um, configured to be infinitely expandable and indestructible. It was going to be a military uh, infrastructure. Uh, of course, most of you will know that the ARPANET became the internet. Uh, and so I, I can be proud to say I did some of the architectural foundation work uh, on internet protocol and even got it published. Uh, but anyway, suffice it to say, uh, at the end of my master's degree, my tutor there, who was a delightful guy, said, Roger, there's no point in you staying on for a PhD. You're not the sort of person who's going to enjoy research. You want to get to the answer quickly. Uh, and so I shot back to Plessy in the UK, believe it or not, uh, who'd partly funded me, uh, just to discover that one of their major divisions was facing imminent uh, catastrophe. Uh, all the technology that underpinned their products had been replaced by digital. They hadn't been part of that. Uh, they were still producing manual switchboards up in Nottingham. Uh, and again, the risk a profile appealed directly to me. Uh, I joined them. I joined them. I, I was actually seduced by a fantastic American personality who'd come in to rescue the division. 15,000 people sitting in Nottingham and factories all over the world. And he said, Roger, you're age 26, come join us. Uh, this is going to be fun. Well, it was unbelievably tough. <laughs> we actually signed a deal with the Silicon Valley startup in 76. Uh, Cupertino was a one-horse town, and I went down there to 
learn all about the startup. Uh, but it led to a fascinating uh, run. We did keep the company going, and as you probably know, it was eventually sold to GEC and Siemens. But that was the beginning of the digital era, uh, and I discovered at that time a new profession, completely out of the blue, called consultancy, management consultancy. Not to be uh, confused with medical consultancy. People used to ask me what part of the what part of the body did I specialize in. And I used to say perhaps the brain, <laughs> uh, but I was a management consultant in those very early days, and I jumped ship from eighty thousand people in Plessy to a startup with five people in London. Uh, Twelve years later, we did a full IPO on the London Stock Exchange. It was a genuine tech startup. Uh, it was absolutely uh, a fabulous run. Uh, it really was remarkable. Uh, we moved just out of the UK to offices right across Europe and built a, a absolutely wonderful company. It was just pure delight to work there. My boss actually got a knighthood. It was a fantastic place. And then we went and uh, we went onto the public market just in the 1989 crash. Uh, and 91, uh, along came computer sciences and bought us. Well, that was the first big disaster of my life. <laughs> it was total wipeout. Uh, it all sounded wonderful on paper. Uh, and I added a new wing to my house, the, the uh, CSC index wing. Uh, but I was out of there within six months. <laughs> it was no point in hanging around. Uh, and after that time, uh, interestingly, the Stanford Research Institute came looking around Europe uh, to see if there was someone who could take up the, uh, the uh, final uh, disintegrating embers of this organization. Uh, they were either going to close it down or renew it. Uh, SRI is actually a big American think tank. Uh, it uh, was the actually um, patented the mouse, uh, invented the first household detergent, fabulous company based in Menlo Park, California, uh, and yet they still had the remnants of a European operation. And I met with the president and I said, give this to me. I'd just love to get my hands on it. Uh, you guys have got fabulous technology in California. You're well known. Uh, it's great pity that this brand has been thoroughly uh, dismembered in Europe. I'd love to take it up. And interestingly, just at that time, uh, this was the mid nineties, um, a company came to us and said, uh, we'd like to have a global research program to look at what business might look like in the 21st century, particularly based on the fact that internet would be a major game changer for, for commerce and for government. So I actually led that study for five years. Uh, and by the end of that time, the dot-com boom was upon us. Uh, and actually, Ernst & Young came searching, knocked on my door and offered me a fabulous amount of money, which I couldn't resist, to come along and run their e-commerce practice in London, uh, right at the very heart of that, um, that new uh, dot-com um, world. But of course, uh, that was 2000, 2001, the whole thing collapsed on its feet. Uh, that was the Nasdaq crash. Uh, we were actually sold off to Cap Gemini, the uh, EY consultant group, uh, and I added another wing to my house, the Cap Gemini uh, wing, uh, <laughs> and promptly left the company. Couldn't stand it. Uh, so that was another interesting <laughs> episode. I often tell graduates when they join uh, my company, I've worked for eight companies, seven of which have ceased to exist. But don't worry, <laughs> you've got a future with us ahead. Uh, but uh, at least uh, having, having left uh, that uh, demise, I picked up with Fujitsu, uh, surprisingly, uh, a company that had acquired ICL. And ICL had been a very prominent British computer company in its time and had gone completely to seed. And again, the Japanese were calling for a complete turnaround, a complete transformation, uh, and I having had some experience in this area, thought this is too good to miss. So I joined Fujitsu in 2003, and for six years, I and our top team labored really hard to uh, resurrect this company. We did, in fact, save 26,000 jobs. The Japanese would have, would have actually closed the company down. Uh, very similar story to uh, 
uh, Rover, uh, having left British Leyland, and, and what happened to Rover, of course, was uh, finally a complete uh, disintegration. Uh, we managed to preserve those jobs, uh, and it was an extraordinarily uh, demanding but interesting time. Uh, 11 countries, 26,000 people, a uh, life or death uh, change program, uh, which I was uh, very deeply involved with. So about that, about, that was really about 2009 when, I mean, you mentioned that you were retiring. I thought, well, one more corporate job won't harm me. Um, and I actually worked for an Indian company, Wipro. Uh, found that the culture was just so different to a Japanese culture, uh, which was very long term. Uh, Wipro was very short term, literally week by week. Um, and I thought, I really don't need this anymore in my life. And I left and I actually uh, went back to my real passion in life, which is thought leadership. I've been fascinated by the impact that technology has had, both on industry and government, but on the world in general. Uh, it's something that I feel I've had some part to play in. I was really deeply involved in developments in mobile communication, in cloud, artificial intelligence, uh, digital communication. I've done all of these things and been very active in all of those things. So I actually came across a community um, of digital leaders, uh, chief inf inf uh, information officers, uh, and I knew the founder of this community. Uh, he invited me to come in a few years ago uh, and take over the UK arm of the community. It now operates in 22 countries, 10,000 members, and essentially we're there to help inspire uh, and educate uh, digital leaders across the globe. Uh, I personally head up now their research activities uh, and I'm running a program in the UK uh, based around innovation, uh, which is something that we believe is important uh, to keep the British industry particularly uh, surviving and flourishing. It's all about reinvention, top line growth, uh, new products, new services, new markets. So that's really keeping me busy. Uh, I'm desperately keen to complete my 50 years in, in, uh, in the IT world. That will happen in uh, 2022. And I think after that, I might begin to slow down a bit because I find at my age, I don't quite have the energy resources I had in my 30s or 40s. Uh, I can get tired at night, I'm very tired. So uh, my, my co-partner in the UK is half my age. Uh, he doesn't seem to suffer from the same energy depletions that I do. But having said all that, uh, I think what, what struck me throughout all of this career, uh, fast moving certainly, is the uh, fascinating challenge that Amin mentioned of solving complex problems. Uh, and I think we've really been privileged to sit with very big, very complex organizations uh, and, and support them and work with them to solve these very complex problems, often even survival. Uh, but certainly my clients have included uh, big companies like IBM, Unilever, uh, et cetera, but also small companies. I'm fascinated by business uh, and the, the environment of business itself. So that's been a privilege. Uh, coming through to the young generation, I, I've had three uh, kids myself. I've been married for 40 years. <laughs> so I was I'm still surprised that I've actually achieved that uh, at the age of 70. Uh, but I've got three boys, all of who pursued their own different careers. And I think what I've noticed, the 70s was a time of fundamental change. There's no doubt that up to the 70s, life was fairly stable, fairly organized, if you had a reasonable amount of intelligence, you become a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher uh, or a civil servant. Um, all of that started to break down. And in the 70s, uh, industry went through a lot of change. Government went through a lot of change. And I think today, after 50 years of digital technology, we're only just beginning. I think the next 50 years are going to be massive, massively traumatic highly volatile, highly uncertain, highly complex. Great news for people who <laughs> enjoy uh, uh, such an environment, bad news for those who don't. But the prices will be terrific. I mean, there is 
challenge galore for the young generation. Uh, one of my kids is really interested in solving global problems like uh, plastics uh, in the sea, uh, climate change, overpopulation. There are fast projects and pro programs to pursue in this, in this new world, uh, and very serious ones. So I think there's great, great opportunity, but I agree with all of you, uh, there's no certainty. So don't imagine that what you start out doing at the age of 21 or 22 is where you're going to end up, because it surely isn't. Uh, and one, one person said very wisely to me recently, he said, Roger, it's all about learning, unlearning, and relearning. That's what it's going to be all about. And of course, that has profound implications again for the educational world. I think mean, education today is still bogged down in a sort of 19th century uh, paradigm. I mean, we, we think that really by the time you leave university, you are educated uh, and you can now go on and uh, pursue your career with confidence. That's completely wrong. And, and the question then, of course, is how do you constantly re-educate people. Uh, what does that look like? And it's more than just online learning. It's gaming, it's experiential, it's a whole range of things. So I think we've got a fantastic challenge for the next generation. Uh, and uh, <laughs> would I wish to go through this again? I'm not sure, but <laughs> I could give it a try, I suspect. But 